So, uh, moving on to the last session, I would like to welcome our uh, chairpersons, uh, Dr. Sandhya Tangade, ma'am, Professor, uh, Department of Oral Pathology, D.Y. Patel University, Mumbai, and Dr. Uh, Faraz Mohammad, sir, Course Director, College of Dentistry from Saudi Arabia. Uh, welcome you, sir and ma'am. So, without much delay, I would like to invite our first presenter, uh, Dr. Kavita. Could you please share your screen? Yeah, you are audible. <clears throat> uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to present a case on osteomyelitis of the maxilla. I thank the Asian Society of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathologists for giving me this uh, platform to present this case. I also thank my professor, Dr. Kanan Rang uh, Ranganathan, sir, for guiding me through this presentation. And I thank all the colleagues of my department for helping me uh, to do this presentation. A 67-year-old male patient presented with pain and swelling in the upper right back tooth region for the past two weeks. He had extraction of 1.6 and 1.7 three weeks back. Uh, that was because of tooth motility. He was a known diabetic and was diagnosed COVID negative. We examined a uh, 5 into 4 centimeter swelling in the right posterior maxillary alveolus in relation to 1.6 and 1.7 region, extending from distal aspect of 1.5 to the maxillary tuberosity anteroposteriorly and from the alveolar ridge to the buccal vestibule mediolaterally. It was tender and firm on palpation. There was bleeding on palpation. There was a reduction in the radiolucency. A mild opacification was seen in the right side of the maxillary sinus in relation to the maxillary posterior alveolar uh, region compared to the left side. A provisional diagnosis of osteomyelitis was given. The differential diagnosis for swelling in the maxillary posterior alveolar region was listed down. Absence of periapical abscess, granuloma, and uh, cyst, we ruled out periapical pathology. With the absence of any drug history like uh, bisphosphonate intake or an anti-angiogenic, anti-cancer drugs, we uh, excluded medication-related osteonecrosis. It could probably be a fungal or bacterial infection, which has ingressed in that extraction wound. Uh, it could be a periosteal re uh, reaction, secondary to uh, post-extraction, uh, a healing phase. Now, this case is a painful swelling in the posterior maxillary alveolar region in a 67-year-old male patient. Now, having this in mind, we know that osteomas, ossifying fibromas, and chondrosarcomas are relatively painless lesions in contrast uh, to the present case. And uh, uh, But for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and chondrosarcoma, most of the lesions have a propensity to occur in the mandible. Even otherwise, osteosarcomas, chondrosarcoma, even sarcoma, uh, they are more common outside the jaws. Extragmatic occurrence is more common. They are relatively rare in the jaws. So bearing this in mind, we proceeded with histopathological examination, hoping to narrow down the diagnosis. We received uh, five bits of tissue specimens for grossing after an incisional biopsy. Now, uh, one specimen was measuring two by two centimeters. The other specimens measured ranging from two centimeter to even one mm. The HND stain section showed dense chronic inflammatory cell infiltrate predom predominantly of lymphocytes and plasma cells focal areas of vital bone and non-vital bone were seen. Past stain section showed flat ribbon-shaped hyphae at right ankles. Those magenta colored hyphae, we see it there on the screen. Suggestive of mucor mycosis. Now, coming back to the differential diagnosis, with this histopathological picture, we were able to rule out the other lesions because nowhere we found bacterial colonies or uh, a benign tumor group consisting of uh, um, compact bone, cancellous bone, ossifying areas. We didn't even find any malignant mesenchymal cells. This helped us to uh, support the diagnosis of osteomyelitis of maxilla with mucormycosis. Osteomyelitis can be defined as an inflammatory condition of the bone, which begins as an infection in the medullary cavity, rapidly involving the aversion system, then extending onto the periosteum. It's more common in the mandible and in the males, 
and it's more frequently uh, it occurs in immunocompromised individuals and patients on medications uh, for osteoporosis and osteopenia like bisphosphonates, anti-angiogenic drugs, they are more vulnerable to develop medication-related osteone uh, osteonecrosis of the jaws. Yes, diabetes is a significant factor in osteomyelitis that is mainly attributed to the hyperglycemia and altered immune response. In maxillary osteomyelitis, diabetes mellitus is usually the propagating factor. You see the immune mechanism, how it's altered, defective chemotaxis, uh, phagocytosis, decrease in antibody synthesis complement levels, resulting in decreased bactericidal function. Fungal osteomyelitis and diabetes, rare, yet a life-threatening infection as we see in this case. Mucormycosis is a fungal infection, which is fulminant and angio-invasive, meaning it invades the arteries, forms thrombus, resulting in ischemic necrosis. And in diabetic patients, mucormycosis is more so common because they have, uh, most of the patients have ketoacidosis. And this one particular fungus, Rhizopus erysis of the family muc uh, mucoraceae, it produces ketoreductases. This will utilize the ketone bodies, it forms a fertile soil for the growth of the fungus. So mucormycotic osteomyelitis with diabetes mellitus, the conventional treatment protocol was followed for this patient where diabetes mellitus um, was treated with debridement, sequestrectomy, allowing involucrum formation with antibiotic and antifungal administration, amoxiclav, metrogel, and amphetamine B was given to this patient. Okay, so in uh, mucormycosis in COVID patients is on the rise. There are case reports and there are, there are hospitals which are reporting that in their uh, centers where they have seen one case of mucormycosis per month in pre-pandemic uh, uh, times, now they see around say two to three cases per day itself. And it's extremely on a uh, uh, significant surge is observed uh, because uh, there are few clinicians who say those patients who have contracted COVID-19 and then they uh, are in the recovery stage are more susceptible to develop these invasive fungal infections, especially mucormycosis involving maxilla. And this could be attributed to two reasons. Uh, those patients who are treated with COVID-19 uh, infections they are uh, given antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics, monoclonal antibodies, steroids, which depresses their immunity. Besides that, even comorbidities uh, like uh, diabetes mellitus uh, with red, high blood glucose levels, have a, uh, they have a compromised immunity. So all that contributes to uh, the uh, exacerbation of pre-existing fungal disease or it will lead to the development of new fungal diseases. However, in this uh, case was COVID negative, but uh, as dentists, we need to bear in mind that COVID-19 in this global pandemic, COVID-19 uh, um, infection uh, is a uh, prevalent amongst the population, we have to uh, consider all the um, muc mucormycotic osteomyelitis with comorbidities like diabetes mellitus or any other immunocompromised states. When we find these patients, we should assess for uh, COVID-19. And early diagnosis, as with any other disease, is uh, going to help us to reduce the, uh, identify the lesion in the right time reduce the morbidity and mortality. Uh, this is to brief on uh, uh, the treatment aspects of mucormycosis. The first line of treatment is always amphotericin B, eoxycholate along with uh, li uh, liposomal uh, amphotericin B could be given along with the combination therapy based on the comorbidities associated. And the second line of treatment along with the uh, amphotericin B, uh, uh, posiconazole antifungals, uh, caspofungin could be given. These are my references. Uh, thank you for your attention. And about it. Thank you so much, Dr. Kavita. Uh, your case was uh, COVID negative, right? 
yes ma'am yes yeah. ma'am uh, but um, but uh, when uh, we got the case uh, they had not tested for uh, uh, covid 19 then subsequently we advised because uh, here we were uh, seeing a spiking increase uh, from the reports uh, and even from the tertiary centers where our college is associated there was an increase in uh, mucormycosis especially of the maxilla and when we get back to the history the patient was just recovering from covid 19 and uh, there are reports in the newspapers where uh, say out of 50 cases of uh, mucormycosis which they have seen 46 cases had chest congestion and pneumonia like infections which were not uh, fully diagnosed or for uh, covid 19 so we need to be aware of it yeah so this combination has been increasing mucormycosis and osteomyelitis we also had a case last week i just wanted to know like um, uh, when the um, the diagnosis at provisional level and when we get a slide of hne stain slide of such cases so it is very difficult um, in the beginning like to locate those fungi under hne so what was your experience so when you saw your hne uh, slide uh, uh, ma'am uh, next did you locate all those fungi very easily under hne uh we were suspecting okay we were looking we thought that if mucormycosis was present we should not miss it out so we took it to uh, periodic acid skip staining and uh, fortunately we found uh, the colonies the hyphal structures were very much evident with the pass chain itself so we had to uh, immediately intimate the clinician so appropriate uh, treatment could be carried on without any delay yeah we also experienced the same like uh, it was difficult initially under hne but when we did pass in last week like so many fungi we saw very easily so just wanted to uh, out of cur- curiosity i wanted to know yeah anything from your side dr faraz yes uh, uh, thank you for your presentation a wonderful presentation you had and um, the you presented about a case of the 67 and elderly patient and uh, earlier you reported like uh, he was diabetes positive and covid negative isn't it more uh, dr sandhya ma'am has already clarified uh, uh, for the covid 19 issue uh, was it a covid the false negative uh, earlier as far as uh, uh, the communication with the clinician is concerned they told that they have uh, identified uh, diagnosed with uh, rt pcr and it is negative so probably we have to uh, um, use the ancillary techniques and uh, check whether uh, for uh, the sensitivity or the specificity of the test to just augment the results obtained we can do that we can still further do that yes okay Yeah, uh, any other superficial fungal infections are evident in such patients? Did you uh, come yes, across sir. any? Yes, sir. Um, uh, candida yes. and uh, aspergillosis is also associated with uh, mucormycosis, as far as the literature is concerned. And yes, it it has been reported. Okay, the floor is open for the audience. If they have any yeah. questions, please. Yeah, uh, can I say something? Yes, please, yes. Uh, Dr. Aditya. Yeah, uh, I think uh, actually, you know, uh, whenever we get a case of osteomyelitis, I think uh, we should routinely check for actinomycosis and also for mucormycosis. Like in our institute, we have a very high instance of cases reporting with mucormycosis. And uh, as uh, Dr. Kavita has presented, and we had one case where the patient was COVID positive. and uh, nowadays uh, the instance of osteomyelitis is quite high so most of the time we make it a point that we do a pas or even a gms so that we have thoroughly ruled out that there is no uh, you know um, overlying uh, fungal infection in most of the cases just to be on the safer side uh, because it is very common nowadays because most of the time they occurs in old patients and most of the time they are diabetic yes. so it is uh, it is better that we do it as a routine so that we have ruled out all possibilities yeah it lies in the diagnostic protocol yes Yes, even today we had a early morning. The first session also had the same case, almost similar to this. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, we are true, Doctor Aditya. 